quiet. We're all ready to go? Yes? Everyone ready? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to brief you on the details as, as I know them and as we know them uh, involving uh, our officer-involved shooting that occurred on January 25th at 2546 Bahama Drive. This is the first officer-involved shooting involving a Dallas police officer in 2023. On January 25th, at around 12.30 p.m., Dallas Police Fugitive Unit officers were in the area of 2500 Wilbur Street on an unrelated investigation. While on Wilbur Street, officers received a wanted person's bulletin and learned a suspect wanted for capital murder out of Farmer's Branch was on the same block. At around 2 p.m., officers located the suspect, 18-year-old Joey Freyer, on Wilbur Street seated in the front passenger seat of a car driven by an unknown male. The fugitive unit members, officers Joshua Gonzalez, Richard Witt, Scott Neal, Victor Lucas, Aaron Hale, and Elliot Howell, followed the car for about an hour, allowing additional resources to respond and to find a location to arrest Freyer. Officers followed the suspect to 2546 Bahama Drive, the Bahama Glen Apartments. At around 2.55 p.m., Officers attempted to take the suspect into custody in the parking lot, and a drone was deployed to assist officers. At around 2.59, as part of a high-risk apprehension, subject unit off, subject, uh, fugitive unit officers gave repeated verbal commands and deployed a distraction device, a flashbang, for the driver and Freyer to exit the vehicle. The driver got out of the vehicle and was taken into custody. The suspect refused to show his hands, exit the vehicle, or follow commands. At 3.01 p.m., fugitive unit deployed pepper ball rounds. The suspect still did not exit the car. At 3.02 p.m., a sergeant monitoring video from the drone operation announced over the radio that Freyer had a gun in his right hand. Also at 3.02, a second flashbang was deployed and Freyer is seen with his gun and fires at Dallas police officers at least twice. The officers returned fire, hitting the suspect multiple times. Frere ran from the car and fell to the ground, ultimately dropping his weapon. Dallas Fire Rescue was called at 3.02, and at 3.07 p.m., first aid was administered by fugitive unit officers until DFR arrived at 3.18. Frere was taken to a local hospital where he died from his injuries at 3.43 p.m. One fugitive unit officer was shot in the left foot. He was taken to a local hospital, treated, and released. The suspect's weapon was recovered at the scene, and a second weapon was recovered near the driver's seat during a search of the car by detectives. The second weapon was modified with a Glock switch. The investigation is ongoing and being investigated by the Dallas Police Special Investigations Unit. The Dallas County District Attorney's Office was notified and responded to the scene and will conduct their own investigation. The Office of Community Police Oversight was notified and responded to the scene. I wanna say any loss of life is tragic as was the loss of life that led us to this event. Unfortunately, Subsec Frere dictated this unfortunate outcome. But it's also a tragedy for our officers who were involved that night. This is never our intended outcome. Our fugitive unit works day in and day out, taking our most violent offenders off the streets of Dallas. I commend their bravery that day, standing steadfast in the face of danger and remaining in the fight as they were fired upon by a violent criminal. We are fortunate that an officer was not lost on that day. These are dangerous, violent criminals they go out after each day, and our men and women, all of them who put their lives on every day to protect and keep our city safe. In an effort, as always, to be transparent, the Dallas Police Department is releasing the body-worn camera footage of this incident, and we'll now uh, take a look at it, and we'll be opening it up to questions when we're done.
Okay, questions? Yes. How many officers shot at Everybody on leave? I'm sorry? How many officers shot at Everybody? Uh Six, and they are on leave. Yes, they're on administrative leave. How many shots uh, uh, Approximately 57 between the six of them. I'd say a few things. Um, I would say number one, that was rounds. Uh, each individual, each individual officer was there, felt fear for their lives. Uh, we had an individual wanted for capital murder uh, that was involved in the murder of an innocent resident of the city of Farmers Branch, who was given every opportunity uh, to surrender peacefully. Uh, the officers were very slow, giving commands. Uh, the individual then decides to shoot at police officers. Uh, a wanted murder suspect uh, decides to shoot at police officers. Um, I, I'm not quite sure um, with that individual would have ran away with that gun uh, into that neighborhood if that's something we want. Um, I think uh, that's the message I'd give to our community. Uh, the fact that this individual uh, was involved in a murder. Uh, this individual shot at police officers. Um, and I would say that as we go through the investigation, each, each officer will have their specific reasoning as to why they shot, why they will fail and fear their lives, as they may or may not have seen at the time a fellow brother officer having gotten stricken and remained in a gunfight with a murder suspect, um, which is, and I know where we're getting at, um, which is very different uh, than the incident that we're all waiting to see the video on from this evening uh, with everything that's going on. You know, I, I understand, I'm not naive, that there'll be some questions about Memphis, but why don't we, let's cover this, and then we'll get back to that, Rebecca. I think you had one more. Yeah, about, about the 57 shots, uh, or less, how many were from the suspect? Uh, at least two. He fired at least two rounds uh, at our officers. How many times was he hit? Uh, right now, we, we don't know how many times he was hit. We'll get more information Chief, on that later. Who fired the shot that hit the officer? I'm sorry? But what we believe the suspect did. The suspect. Yes. Chief, you said that the suspect was spotted, followed for an hour. Um, so, I mean, there seems to be some sort of thought and strategy that was put into where officers confronted him. Can you explain why it happened at the apartment complex? Well, you know, the officers, again, have to figure out where tactically is their best opportunity. Uh, to take someone into custody. Uh, where that individual stopped, uh, they felt probably there was no fear of a vehicle pursuit, the way the vehicle was positioned. That's something obviously that we're always concerned about. Uh, again, as we go into the investigation, and will, those answers will come, will come out with regards to why they picked that particular location. Uh, but following for an hour, uh, I'm confident that they were trying to find out where the best position to safely take him into custody. Uh, again, um, we don't want this outcome. But unfortunately, Suspect Frere's decision to fire upon police officers is what led to this ultimate outcome. Uh, had he surrendered, uh, just like the driver did, we wouldn't be here today. Um, and so, but those questions will get answered as the investigation's ongoing. Chief, where all did they go? Where all, in this hour, where all were your officers, the detectives, um, what kind of locations, I guess, that led them to? The uh, well, in the area. I mean, I, I don't know specifically. Again, we'll, we're... We're just a few days into, into figuring out exactly where they were at. I just know they were in the area there. They heard that this individual was also in the area that was wanted, and that's why they switched, uh, they, they switched on to him. And I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. What would you say? Has the department been in contact with the suspect's family, and would they give them an opportunity to watch the video? Uh, the family has. I'm sorry? In, in terms of the danger to residents at the apartment complex, have we determined how many did not? If you saw that, the, 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 one, uh, the one wall, uh, there was like a, I, I'm imagining it's a wood wall behind where the suspect was, where he finally went down, uh, looked like it had some strike marks on it. Uh, but again, uh, it's unfortunate uh, that it happens here. Uh, but again, as officers are getting fired upon, um, you know, they also have to weigh the, the, the perspectives of the, this wanted uh, murder suspect getting out into that neighborhood as well with a firearm. Um, and so, yes, we're always mindful of our backdrops. Um, and fortunately, uh, you know, no, no, no one else was, was injured in this, in, the, in this instance. How long was like, um, were you all? Yes, sir. What else can you tell us about the capital murder warrant that Frio was 
Um, all I all I know right now is that it was a home invasion uh, that had occurred that the suspect was involved in uh, that cost the life of an innocent uh, resident of uh, Farmers Branch. How long have y'all been in this? I guess it's a standoff at this point, and during that time, did y'all were y'all able to go to this immediate area to get residents to safety, or at least let them know, hey, get away from your windows or whatever? And also uh, the drone. How was this like? A, I'm sure y'all use it a lot, but. I mean, this seems to be very pivotal and very important in this case where y'all can see exactly what was in this guy's hand. Yeah, well, I'll say, you know, obviously, it would have been, if this would have been a, a regular barricaded type of suspect, if this would have dr got drawn out, we would have done our best. Uh, to try to message, it happened very quickly at this mo at, at this time, so it was very difficult to get that. Uh, with, as far as the drone, yeah, it was an incredible tool uh, for our men and women uh, that are out there in this particular case, and for all those officers to know that the suspect was armed. Uh, obviously, uh, he was been, had been giving commands of surrender, uh, and for the drone to actually have seen the suspect with the weapon still in his right hand after that, uh, it certainly gives the officers a moment to, uh, you know, to to understand that uh, that. You know this individual uh, may take may take fire, or they may take fire from this individual. So it was an incredibly important tool. In your experience and expertise, is there any protocol not being followed in this video? Well, you know, as I say right now, I mean, from a 64,000 foot level, when individuals shooting at officers and the officers feeling thrilled for their lives, obviously. Uh, we'll look at this as we look at every other case uh, to see if there's things from a training perspective that we can do. Uh, but again, as I stand here, I think we're, we're fortunate that we did not lose a Dallas police officer, uh, not only from the round that he shot that uh, hit one of our officers in the foot, uh, but had the Glock switch weapon been used uh, that this individual had access to, uh, things would have been a lot worse as well. Um, it's unfortunate, loss of life, uh, but we're fortunate also that we didn't lose uh, a Dallas police officer in this instance. What can you tell us about the weapon, um, The weapon, uh, was it a... It was a handgun, but a 9mm? 9mm. Semi-automatic. Was this whole weapon or what, uh, how he got the weapon? Uh, that I don't know of right now. I don't know if it's stolen or how we got it, but I know there were two weapons in the car. Did you lose the driver and how did you charge the weapon? Uh, we don't, have not putting out the information on the driver just yet, and they have not yet uh, been charged with anything. Was it the SWAT officers who were performing aid at the end of the video? The fugitive, fugitive unit officers. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I mentioned it in the briefing as, as the, the timetables here at, uh, they started rendering aid. The shooting started. 2.55, they got into the parking lot. Well, hold, hold on. The, at 3.02, a second flashbang was deployed and Freire is seen with his gun and fires. So he starts firing at 3.02 and uh, at 3.07, first aid was administered by fugitive unit officers. Um, we'll get all the information on, the, on their names and the years they have on the force, but yes, I've spoken to the officer several times. Uh, he's doing well. He's in great spirits, and we're hopefully to have him back. Did you say he had a weapon with a Glock switch on it? He had. There was another weapon with a Glock switch, uh, which he had access to in the vehicle. And what he is did that? not. What is a modified Glock switch? What is that? So what a Glock switch does, um, a Glock switch transforms uh, uh, a Glock handgun into a fully automatic weapon. But that was not the one he used? That is not the one he used. And, and At least twice. Yeah, at least twice. Well, you know, I'll say I've been in contact with uh, Chief C.J. Davis from Memphis uh, from a major city chief's perspective with the uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation as well as the FBI uh, since last Saturday about things that have, were occurring and some of the timelines that were going to be occurring. Uh, first and foremost, really to prepare. I mean, I think really we've got to prepare the community. I have not seen the video yet, uh, but people that I trust uh, that have been in law enforcement for a very long time have, uh, and they say it's terrible. Uh, so the first thing is really to prepare the community, uh, prepare our faith leaders, prepare our men and women for what they will see later this afternoon. That's number one. 
Uh, number two really is in communicating uh, the information uh, to all parties involved with regards to what they're about to see. Um, and if the video is what uh, it has been reported as, um, to ask for calm and peace. Obviously, the officers, I commend uh, Chief Davis, and I told her this. Um, you know, uh, I think she's done a remarkable job in the face of crisis uh, and how expedient she was and the department was uh, in the administrative aspect of the case. Uh, the fact that the officers were terminated, uh, the fact that uh, the officers have been charged, um, you know, obviously with the biggest charge being second degree murder. Um, and so, you know, that, that obviously um, is something that, you know, oftentimes it's not just the incident. Uh, but it's the manner in which we as police departments respond to that incident that we're often judged by. And I think uh, Memphis Police Department and Chief Davis has done a very good job at that. Um, you know, and then also, again, having to prepare uh, our department uh, for what we have seen before, uh, hopefully asking for peace, but obviously being in the preparation that we understand. Uh, no one, if this video is what has been portrayed to be, uh, no one is more upset about it um, as we are as upset as a community as a whole is, that our badge once again has gotten tarnished. Uh, we stand, out, stand alongside our community for justice uh, and frustration. And uh, I believe that we want uh, people to have that opportunity to vent, uh, but to do so peacefully, uh, that we're not gonna tolerate lawlessness. Uh, violence is not the answer. And we're doing our best to prepare for that possibility if it occurs. But we don't, wanna, we don't, we don't want that to happen. We hope that doesn't happen. Um, we hope that it's peaceful here. I've been in contact uh, several times uh, with my colleagues around the country uh, and in Canada uh, that are also uh, preparing uh, and messaging and doing very similar things that we've done here. Uh, and so, you know, obviously I won't get into tactics or what we're doing to prepare, uh, but we are, we feel that we have, uh, have done our due diligence with regards to ensure the safety of the city um, if this, uh, and do what we can to ensure the safety of the city um, in the event uh, that uh, things go awry. What was the response from the state police? Did they say they would stand alongside you and try and ask for calm as well? Well, I think, I think I have, yes, I've gotten that sense also. Um, I think uh, the fact that, you know, just being transparent, we're not, um, there's no sugarcoating this. Um, again, I have not seen the video yet. Um, and so I, I, I want to, I'm waiting to see the video as much, as, just as you all are, as, as our community is. Uh, and but understanding and saying it like it is uh, what, what, everything that we've been hearing um, uh, with regards to uh, the brutality uh, and I believe I mean Chief Davis has used a lot of words uh, to describe that none of them are good um, and so um, you know just just understanding and them knowing that we're right alongside with our community and with our faith leaders that as a profession we have to be better um, and uh, and so that's, that's really what we're preparing for, uh, what our men and women are preparing for. Um, but again, uh, I don't want to sit out here and think that we're on, uh, you know, expecting things to, to go poorly. We expect things to go well. We expect our community uh, to understand that accountability is being taken here at its highest level. Uh, and we, we truly hope that we can do this. Uh, if, if things occur, we hope that they're peaceful. Well, again, you know, and I'll say this, obviously the charges in it by themselves, the administrative uh, firing of the officers is one thing, seeing the video will be a completely different thing. All those things put together, I will tell you, yes, it does take us all back. Um, you know, we often say this, and it's not, it, it's not cliche, what happens in one part of this country affects us all, uh, which is why Major City Chiefs Association has been in such close contact all week uh, about what, what can occur. Uh, obviously, keeping in mind the intelligence and seeing where, where, where things can be happening. Uh, but certainly uh, will sets us all back. Um, you know, we've done a lot in our community here in Dallas. Uh, we're out with our community constantly here in Dallas, but we know that we're gonna have to continue to build on that and try even harder, uh, you know, as well. Um, we also stand by the honorable men and women of the Memphis Police Department uh, that risk their lives every day that aren't indicative of those five individual officers. That's important to remember also that that community needs their law enforcement, needs their honorable men and women too. 
Um, you know, I often say this, our communities want us to be just, and we will be. Our communities want us to be professional, and we strive to be, uh, but they never want us to go away. I've been there, I've seen it, and we just have to continue to build on that. Um, and so we, we, we won't stop. Um, you know, this incident is not what's gonna be the catalyst for us to continue our community outreach. Uh, we've done it before. Uh, we will do it again, and we will continue to strive to do that so that our community understands and recognizes that when we're right, we're right. But when we're wrong, we will hold ourselves accountable. And I think we have, uh, we have done that here in Dallas, and we will continue to do that here in Dallas. Anything else, guys? Last question. Can you confirm the name of the officer who was shot in the um, I can get that for you after. Yeah, we'll get it, we'll get it, we'll, we'll get, we'll get it for you after. Okay, thank you. Thank you.